If you know someone who's dealt with depression, you know that it can take weeks to months to start to improve after beginning treatment. And adding to the challenge is that many of the commonly prescribed antidepressants like SSRIs and similar agents don't work well for everybody and they can come with a lot of side effects. But we've learned something really important over the last few years, and that's that when treatments work for depression and related conditions, it's accompanied by science that the brain is rewiring. So the new science of treatment for depression is focused on enhancing the brain's ability to heal itself through a process called neuroplasticity. We'll talk in this episode about a pharmacologic tool that's been shown to induce rapid neuroplasticity and improvement of symptoms, possibly paving the way for new treatments. And that tool is ketamine. If you fall and break your leg in the wilderness, or if you end up in the ER with a dislocated shoulder, there's a good chance that the ER doc taking care of you might use ketamine as a sedative while they fix your injuries. And that's how ketamine was originally developed, was as an anesthetic. But ketamine is different. While most anesthetics slow the brain down, ketamine is what we call a dissociative anesthetic, meaning that it allows the patient to detach from the immediate experience. So if the ER doc has to reposition a broken bone, you may be aware of the painful stimulus, but not particularly bothered by it. We'll take a deep dive into how ketamine might be working in the brain in a few minutes, but at least for anesthesia, the main way it's thought to work is by blocking a receptor called the NMDA receptor located on the surface of neurons. This is a type of glutamate receptor. But that's just for anesthesia. What's the evidence that ketamine actually works for things like depression and anxiety and PTSD? Before we get too far, I do want to step back and say that although ketamine is promising as an antidepressant agent, it does have well-established risks, and a well-trained physician will be familiar with those risks and be able to weigh those on an individual basis. So none of the following is medical advice, and you should always consult with your physician before making any health decisions. Scientists started to notice some very interesting antidepressant effects of ketamine in the 1970s up through the 1990s, specifically in animal models of depression. Now, the ethics of those studies is a topic for another debate, but these were studies where animals were exposed to chronic, repeated, unpredictable stress, including physical stress and social defeat, and the effects of ketamine was measured in terms of its ability to reverse depressive types of behaviors. And the reported effects of ketamine were remarkable for two reasons. The first is that it induced almost immediate reversal of depressive symptoms in the animals. And the second is that the reversal and improvement of depressive symptoms seemed to last beyond the time where ketamine would be known to be in the animal's system. So it had relative durability. Now, because the effects were promising for treating depression in an animal model, this led to some of the first human trials. Fast forward to today, and now we have many human clinical trials of ketamine for depression and a meta-analysis of those clinical trials was recently published in 2023 in The Lancet. So for background, a meta-analysis is where the researchers combine the findings of many different studies and combine them into a summary measurement using a statistical model. So the researchers included 49 eligible trials, and they included information about the dose of ketamine that was used and the type of ketamine that was used. And the reason that's important is that when we're talking about ketamine, we're actually talking about two different molecules that are mere images of one another. When we're talking about ketamine in general, we're actually talking about a mixture of both. And the technical term for this is called racemic ketamine. This is a mix of the R and the S forms of ketamine. So after the researchers combined the results of all these clinical trials, the meta-analysis supported the conclusion that racemic ketamine improves depressive symptoms in patients with depression, not only after the initial dose, but across repeated doses over time out to a month, and the effects persisted after the final dose. So we now have some pretty solid data that ketamine can be an effective antidepressant, at least in the short to medium term, in the order of weeks to months. What we don't yet have is long-term data. So we don't know whether ketamine is an effective treatment for depression on the order from months to years. So with all this data coming out that ketamine can be an effective treatment for depression, Researchers also decided to look at ketamine as a potential treatment for related conditions. One of those conditions is PTSD. So a recent meta-analysis of various types of clinical trials of ketamine for PTSD showed that ketamine was in fact able to decrease PTSD symptom scores when used in combination with other 
therapeutic modalities like psychotherapy and prolonged exposure therapy. Now, the data here are, in my opinion, nowhere near as strong as they are for ketamine with depression. So we'll have to see what larger and longitudinal studies show us. Another condition related to depression is anxiety. And for the purposes of ketamine, we're interested more in the chronic kinds of anxiety, like generalized anxiety disorder, where people are just worried on a day-to-day -day basis chronically, and social anxiety. In terms of its ability to treat chronic types of anxiety, I'll say that I am skeptical of ketamine as a treatment here. Although there are some clinical trials that show a reduction in anxiety scores on the order of days, even out to a couple of weeks, there's just not enough data to have any level of confidence that ketamine is an effective treatment for chronic anxiety at this time. So we just need more trials and larger and longer trials. So let's move on now to what I think is one of the most fascinating parts about how ketamine might be able to treat depression, which is by inducing neuroplasticity. Before we get there, we have to understand what happens in the brain in depression. And the reality is that there are probably multiple pathways to depression. But in terms of ketamine and neuroplasticity, there are a few features we want to focus on. The first is that individuals with depression can have brain atrophy in two specific areas, and that would be the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. They also have decreases in functional connectivity in the frontal limbic system. And at the microscopic level, individuals with depression can also have loss of the spines on dendrites of neurons. We'll get to what those are in just a moment as well as reductions in the number of support cells for neurons called glial cells. So how does neuronal atrophy happen in depression? One of the most intriguing mechanisms is that exposure to chronic and toxic stress becomes toxic to neurons leading into depression. So how does stress actually become toxic? The first proposed way is glutamate toxicity. So under normal conditions, glutamate is transmitted from one neuron and released into the synaptic cleft, which is the space between neurons. And under conditions of high stress, this transmission or release of glutamate into the synaptic cleft is increased. Under normal conditions, that glutamate would be cleared out or taken away by support cells called astrocytes. But we know that in depression, astrocytes are dysfunctional in, their, in terms of their ability to transport and clear glutamate. And so this working theory is that glutamate causes toxicity due to impaired glutamate clearance in depression. The second way is the endocrine system. Under conditions of chronic stress, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is upregulated, which leads to excess cortisol, which can be toxic to neurons. And this has been demonstrated specifically in hippocampal neurons. And finally, Stress seems to reduce neurotrophic factors in the brain. These are factors like BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor that are important for cell maintenance and growth and healthy neurons in the brain. We know, for example, that rodents exposed to chronic stress are more vulnerable to depression if they lack BDNF. In humans, we also see a variant called VAL66MET, which is associated with lower levels of BDNF and also associates with increased vulnerability to mood disorders in humans. So we've talked about toxic stress and how it can be damaging to neurons and potentially lead into depression. And now let's talk about how ketamine can potentially reverse some of these brain changes. What I've put up on the screen might be one of the most mind-blowing phenomena that occurs after ketamine administration. What we're looking at are a part of the neuron called the dendrites. And these are the parts of the neuron that receive signals from upstream or presynaptic neurons. So what you see in the left image is a normal dendrite from a non-depressed animal. And the dots or the buds that you see protruding from the dendrite are called dendritic spines. In the middle image is a dendrite from an animal exposed to chronic and unpredictable stress for 21 days. And it's easy to see that the dendrite from this animal has fewer spines on it. And on the right is a dendrite from an animal that also had exposure to chronic and unpredictable stress, but then received ketamine. And this image is from a sample taken 24 hours after ketamine exposure, showing essentially complete restoration of spine density and diameter. And these types of findings have been shown in many different studies. 
What this means is that there are physical changes occurring within neurons extremely quickly after ketamine exposure. Now, many studies, as I mentioned, have looked at dendritic spine density and morphology, but there is a small study as well showing that ketamine may be able to restore dendritic length after it's reduced by chronic cortisol exposure. So this is probably some of the best evidence that we have showing that ketamine may be inducing neuroplasticity. But the question remains, how is it doing this? So we talked about how ketamine binds to and blocks a type of receptor called the NMDA receptor. And it turns out that it can preferentially do this on inhibitory interneurons. And so ketamine can have this paradoxical effect, although it is a glutamate receptor blocker, of taking the brakes off of the upstream neurons, resulting in a surge of glutamate to the prefrontal cortex. This leads to the activation of another kind of glutamate receptor called the AMPA receptor. And the name isn't necessarily important to remember, but we know that the AMPA receptor is important because when it's knocked out or when it's blocked with another molecule, ketamine loses its antidepressant effects. Another line of evidence that we have that ketamine is acting across multiple systems is its effect on BDNF and its relation to depression. So ketamine rapidly raises BDNF, and that will then go activate and bind to its receptor called TERK-B. And interestingly, ketamine itself can bind to TERK-B. Once TERK-B is bound to and activated, that signals a cascade of downstream signaling for cell growth and maintenance. How do we know that the BDNF TERK-B pathway is important for ketamine's effect? It's because when that pathway is blocked, ketamine loses some of its antidepressant effect. And then lastly, ketamine does seem to have this kind of immediate antidepressant effect. And it's been thought that this may be attributable to its inhibition of a certain part of the brain called the lateral hibernula. This has been called the anti-reward center or the disappointment center of the brain. And it's responsible for feelings of despair and anhedonia or loss of interest in things that used to bring happiness. When the lateral habenula is stimulated, it leads to these kinds of feelings of despair. And when ketamine is administered, it rapidly blocks the bursting activity of the lateral habenula, leading to relief from these kinds of symptoms. So we've talked about the evidence for ketamine in depression. We've talked about how it might be working in the brain. We talked about its potential upsides, but it's important to know that there are important risks and we'll go through some of these, but not all of them. The first is that when ketamine is administered, it commonly raises heart rate and blood pressure. And this is usually not a problem, but it can be a problem for some people. Second, a couple rare but serious side effects are respiratory depression, which is the opposite of ketamine's usual effect, and laryngospasm, where the muscles of the upper airway tense up and cause constriction. These tend to be pretty rare and associated with higher doses that are pushed more rapidly but if you talk to most experienced ER doctors, they will tell you that they have seen them. Third, ketamine can cause nausea and occasionally vomiting in both the initial phases of the medication and during the recovery period when the medication is wearing off. Fourth, ketamine can induce seizures in some patients. Fifth, it's important to know about what's called the emergence reaction and the potential to enter what's called the K-hole. These can be associated with uncomfortable emotional feelings, paranoia, disorientation, and even potentially hallucinations. So what I would want to see in a clinic that's administering ketamine is that they have medications available to be able to deal with these kinds of side effects, as well as equipment available to deal with the types of airway issues that we mentioned previously. There has been some concern that ketamine, when used in conditions like schizophrenia, or if a patient has a prior history of psychosis, that ketamine can cause the induction of psychosis. And seventh, in general, ketamine used in a repeated fashion is not known to be safe in the developing brain. And then lastly, there are some data in retrospective human studies and animal studies that extremely high doses of ketamine given over a long period of time can lead to cognitive impairment. And there are a few different ways that's been proposed to happen. The most common purported mechanism that I've seen is having to do with excitotoxicity. So I'll wrap up here by saying that we talked a lot about depression through a pharmacologic lens, but that's just one side of the coin. And if we only think about depression as something that can be treated with a medication, we're gonna miss a lot of opportunity 
to instill lasting behavioral changes, things like exercising, getting enough sleep, eating well, taking care of yourself, making time for fun and the things that bring us fulfillment. With that, thanks so much for listening. If you want to support this channel, the very best way to do that is to hit the like and subscribe button. If you're on Spotify and are able to head over and leave a review, it helps so that the algorithm can pick up the channel and share it with more people. You can find a link to the Spotify channel in the description. Please do head over there, leave a review. Even if it's only one word, it helps out a ton. With that, thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.